Coming to you from Forager Brewery in Rochester, our town. Hey, and welcome to Our Town, the show about Rochester. I'm Eric Olson. Tops tonight, the Minnesota legislature adjourned this spring without a transportation bill, without a bonding bill, and Governor Va Dayton vetoed the tax bill. Talks of a special session have saw stalled. Why not talk about Senator <laughs> Dave Sedgham with this uh, great lead in? But a lot did get accomplished this session, but not quite as much as you probably yeah. would like. Welcome, Senator Sedgham. Well, Sanchez. it's so good to be here. And, and Eric, thank you for doing this. It's a wonderful venue and wonderful show. And wish you the best of luck. Thanks. So with regard to the legislature, yeah, we, we started on May, March, let's see, uh, Mar yeah, March 3rd, ended May 23rd. I thought we had a pretty good session, uh, really up until the last eight minutes. Uh, and that may sound kind of strange, but uh, within the, the span of that eight minutes, uh, the whole session really dissolved with the uh, failure of the bonding bill to pass and uh, the transportation bill then uh, uh, being part of it also passed, or failed rather, and, uh, and the tax bill was sort of kind of on the outside, uh, passed both bodies strongly. but. Uh, uh, had this little errand, which we believe could have been fixed administratively, but uh, uh, that was kind of being held hostage to this whole process as well. So in the end, uh, you know, not a real good session in terms of results, uh, but I thought, you know, going through the session, we had good collegiality, good workability, and, uh, and we got a lot of things done, except it didn't get done. <laughs> right, and the bonding bill, how does that impact the fact that you don't have one right now? What projects in Rochester, Olmstead County are impacted because of that? Well, uh, you know, it's hard to say, I won't say the big one, but the kind of the, the headliner, I suppose, is uh, the Rochester Airport and the custom station there needing to uh, be, if you will, be rebuilt, revised, remodeled uh, to accommodate uh, uh, the security issues that uh, now the TSA is more involved in from the standpoint of uh, all of the airports in America. Ours doesn't really kind of meet standards they wanted to fix, but we also have the Reading Center down the street here. and. Uh, and Highway 14 has been huge, of course, uh, to our area. And uh, that was in the bonding bill. Uh, it was ready to be fixed. And, uh, and of course, we're going to have to wait for another time. There's progress made on 14 in past sessions. Incrementally, it's yeah. A little bit here and a little bit there. This would have fixed uh, the, certainly the Otana to, uh, to Dodd Center uh, rung, if you will, or span, and, and also over uh, west of Mankato uh, uh, in the Nicollet County area. What are you hearing from, are you hearing anything from your leadership or the governor's office about where we stand with that bonding bill? Because as you talk about the Rochester programs, there are, there are projects like these all yeah, over the state right, of Minnesota yeah. with folks kind of waiting to see whether yeah, they will yeah. be going forward or not. And the answer is uh, basically there was three or four meetings that, uh, if you will, leadership had with the governor. Uh, and it all came down to Southwest Light Rail, whether that's in the bill or out of the bill. A little bit of the University of Minnesota, uh, 66 million in my view, we could have put that in a bonding bill and if that would have been good to go with the governor, we could, you know, we, we ought to be in session right now today uh, getting that done. But the Southwest Rail project is the big kind of hang up. Uh, House Republicans in particular uh, aren't necessarily in favor of it, certainly at this time. And that is kind of, that's, that's the linchpin, if you will. Uh, beyond that, we, got the, uh, we can fix that tax bill real quickly. And the transportation, a little harder with respect to the gas bill, but the gas tax, but we had 700 million in that uh, bonding bill for transportation. Is so. the problem the Senate Democrats with regard to light rail? That, uh, is that holding things up? Well, or support? The, you know, it? I don't want to make this partisan or anything. Oh, but, come on, but, let's but, make it partisan. Well, come on, let's go on. <laughs> but, uh, you know, yeah, they stood tall for light rail uh, when, when, when the moment of truth really came. Uh, it was, uh, it was. It's uh, a bone of contention. It was yep. a bone of contention. It was, uh, the, you know, without light rail, there was no bonding bill. You've been in the legislature for years. I was a reporter covering the Capitol 20 yeah. years ago. I, this last minute stuff, the last seven minutes, or you mentioned eight minutes before the end of the session. It doesn't seem like it was, there was always hectic activity sure. and it was, down to the wire, but this down to the last minute, what's what's going on with that? It's, uh, it, it, you know, it does come down to eight minutes. The truth be known on the bonding bill, we'd, we'd worked on that, uh, you know, frankly, all going into last fall. And so 
incrementally we work towards that. Uh, the bill was probably ready two or three days before that. It just, if you will, got to the floor the last eight uh. minutes. Uh, so it had been well vetted. Uh, we had a chance certainly in the, in the Senate Republican caucus to know what was in that bill. Anybody says they didn't know what the bill, uh, I don't know, I would say it's your own fault because we certainly had plenty okay, of time. Okay, so yeah. from the outside looking, it's not a systemic change of some sort. It's because if you don't watch all the time, you might think that there was something changed. I don't think so. Okay. You know, I can remember tax bills coming in with you know three hundred million dollar tax bills with ten minutes to go, and so you okay. know it's not the way you'd run a business. But you know this is a this is a contact sport, and you know people do play the clock, and you know. But this could have worked. This this session could have worked, but for the Southwest Rail and amendment. And still might come through. Never well, know. Well, I hope so. I yep. hope I hope we can make this work. It's uh, as you said, this is all about good projects across Minnesota, a good tax bill a good jump start on some additional transportation funding and I hope we can get it done. Honored to have you here, Senator. It's David wonderful Sengen. to be here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. to you in part by the following amazing people and organizations. Clements Subaru, proudly partners with award-winning KSMQ Public Television. Clements Subaru of Rochester. Clements Clear Value Promise is to make buying a car fast, fair, and simple. The University of Minnesota Rochester, an undergraduate health sciences university offering education designed to change tomorrow's health care. University of Minnesota Rochester, always in the heart of our community. The Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. And the members of KSMQ Public Television. Thank you. Coming up later in the show, we meet the man who plays the bells high above the city. We get the history on the Rochester State Hospital, and Anthony Whitmer introduces us to the Waste Wizard. We'll see if we can stump him. Up next, our town culture learns more about one of America's favorite pastimes, baseball, of course, when we take in a honkers game. Good, boy. <laughs> Hi, my name is Dan Litzer. I'm the general manager and co-owner of the Rochester Honkers Baseball Club, a member of the Northwoods League. And welcome to Mayo Field for Mascot Olympics, one of our promos for the 2016 season. Um, as you can see, the Rochester Honkers is a family fun environment. Uh, we're geared towards, you know, the entertainment aspect along with the baseball aspect. A uh, little thing about the Rochester Honkers is we're a summer collegiate team, which means we play strictly in the summer and nothing but college baseball players that come from across the United States. Think of it as the, the minor league internship, where college players with college eligibility come to play in a setting that's just like the minor leagues, where we play 72 games in 76 days. Uh, we have 18 teams in the Northwoods League. Uh, teams in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, Michigan, and also up in Ontario and Thunder Bay. You know, it's the entertainment side. Sure, you have the 25, 30% of the fans that, that are true baseball fans where they come for the enjoyment of the game and the love of the game, but everything else, it's an entertainment side. So, you know, you're seeing a, a night out of entertainment. Uh, and for only $8, you know, when you come out to the ball game, it's like a live theater. You get two and a half, three hours of, of entertainment. It just happens to be a baseball game. So that's why I think fans come out. It's, it's, it's friendly, it's fun, it's affordable, um, it's wholesome, it's, it's America's pastime, it's baseball. Our two longest trips uh, to come from Rochester, we have to travel to Thunder Bay, Ontario, and also we have two teams in Battle Creek, Michigan, and Kalamazoo, Michigan. So those are our longest travel times. Uh, we tell our, our players, they go, how far is Kalamazoo? We tell them it's three movies on the bus, which is about 10 hours. A lot of people ask us, you know, is your attendance affected by the wins and losses? In Rochester, it's not. They're looking for the entertaining aspect. You know, it's a fun night out because they're seeing the kids play with heart and with passion, and the chips fall where they do, and sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, and sometimes they're in. Oh, but you know, the, the players are, you know, are very unique. So you're meshing kids that are 18 to 21, 22 years old. Um, they don't all get along, but when you take, you know, 30 guys and 
put them in a dugout and tell them to get along. It's, it's kind of unique. And the faster they bond and become friends, I think the better the teams play. So you're getting kids uh, that have been drafted, that still show up. You're getting kids that want to be drafted. Um, you're having sons of foreign major league ball players that come through here. The pedigrees of a lot of the kids is truly amazing. Uh, we've had so far seven guys that have played for the Rochester Honkers that have made the big leagues. Andre Ether, who plays for the Dodgers, is our probably most notable. Uh, we have another five or six guys that are in the big leagues right now, and it's really neat to see them on TV. And they're like, I remember that guy when he's playing here. Or if you're a host family, it's like, Brian Flynn, yeah, he stayed in my basement. And by the way, he's a left-handed pitcher for the Kansas City Royals. Um, we've, we try to get some local players and local talent to play. And uh, obviously, we have Jackson Douglas this year, who's from uh, Rochester. Uh, in the past, we've had Danny Lawler, Dan Lyons, um, Steve Saratori. But there's a lot of kids that have been stars in Rochester. Aaron Senny is another one to keep trying to remember back 23 years how many guys play for you. Uh, it's unique, but we try and get the local athlete here for another draw locally. Um, but there's also a very uniqueness of having guys that are playing at number, wing, number one rank in the Cal State Fullerton or Tulane or, or Rice and having guys from big league programs that you're watching on the on TV that are the College World Series. So now that when the World Series is over, we get some guys from those teams and, and they show up and boost to the roster a little bit. So that's a uniqueness. You're seeing the stars of tomorrow shine today, which is which is the greatness. Because you can go back in, in five years and go, I remember when I knew him and now he's on ESPN. And that's the really neat tie that you get uh, with the North Jersey and the Rochester Honkers. For more information about this story and other Our Town features, connect with us on Facebook, Twitter at KSMQ hashtag Our Town, or ksmq.org slash Our Town. Love the Honkers. Taking in a Honkers game, it's a great way to enjoy the summer. And they now have a special offer available for the Sunday, July 10th games. Coming up this Sunday, for the sixth straight year, Olmstead County Public Health and the Rochester Honkers baseball team are working together to promote physical activity. You can get a free ticket for you and for your family by riding your bikes to Mayo Field. Or if you park in the City County 4th Street parking lot, that's the one across from uh, Super America, and walk the River Trail to Mayo Field, you can also earn those free tickets. How about that? There are 200 tickets set aside for this project, and they are available between noon and 1 p.m. Game starts at 105. If you're interested in seeing what a modern-day wishing well looks like, well, Mayo Civic Center announced a green light for the new Poshu Wang sculpture that will be placed on the new south side of the newly renovated building as part of its public art project. Visitors will be able to type in a sentiment on a keyboard and watch it be converted to sound and light through the 13-foot sculpture. Cool! Placement of the sculpture will be in 2017. And I know, I know, summer is not even to the halfway mark, but there are people out there thinking about a successful start to the school year. The United Way of Homestead County is asking for backpacks for their 2016 Running Start for School initiative. New backpacks, please, new ones, can be dropped off between 8.30 in the morning and 5 in the afternoon, Monday through Friday at the United Way. Their goal is to collect 9,000 backpacks. Stay with us. Jennifer Rogers is up next. This week she ascended to the Carillon Bells to meet the men who play eight, the man who plays eight times a week for the benefit of the community. Hi guys, I'm here with Jeff of Carol Newer. Right? I said yes. that correct? Right, okay. Right, right. We are here at the Plumber Building of Mayo Clinic. So tell me, what are your duties? We're here and my duties are to play this instrument. Uh, this instrument has been here since the building was new in 1928. And um, the bells have been rung consistently uh, from 1928 until now. So is this somewhat like a piano? Do you have to have piano skills to... A piano, probably even more so organ, because organ. we use our feet too. You'll see that. We use our feet down here. I was just a helper from uh, Caroliner number two, and I'm Caroliner number three. So since 1928, I'm the third Caroliner. 
There's only about 180 of these instruments in North America. So how often do you do this? Like, I ring eight, at least eight times a week. Okay. So there's eight rings, and we often have visitors come up and join us for those, these rings. Um, I have uh, several understudies too, and uh, so if I'm not here, we, we always keep the schedule. The clock, I think, is going to go off real soon if my watch is right. And when we hear the uh, tolling of the hour, that'll be our large bell. Thank you so much, Jeff, Thank for you. having Thanks us for here. Up. I am Jennifer Rogers, your host with Our Town Walkabout. Getting ready for our conversation with Anthony Whitmer when he answers our big questions. Exactly who or what is the waste wizard? Stick around. <laughs> our past, remembering what made us who we are today. Brought to you by the History Center of Olmsted County. As early as 1865, Minnesota was in need of an insane asylum. Though Rochester was initially considered as a location, St. Peter was chosen for the first facility. Ten years later, a state inebriate asylum, place to cure drunkards, was needed. This time, Rochester got the call. But before completion, overcrowding at St. Peter led to the decision to change Rochester's institute into the second insane hospital, which opened with 100 patients in 1879. By 1884, an expanded hospital housed 1,600 patients. Eventually known as Rochester State Hospital, doctors there strove to rehabilitate patients through medical, recreational, industrial, and occupational therapies. A training school for nurses was established in 1889. By the 1930s, patients came to the hospital voluntarily, and many of them returned home. When the hospital closed in 1982, it had served thousands of patients. A memorial to them and the staff now stands in East Park. Disposing of things you don't want any longer is a complicated business these days. Anthony Whitmer has all the answers regarding what goes where. Welcome. Anthony, you're with Olmsted County with the environmental folks there. Uh, correct, Olmsted County Environmental Resources. And we're talking about recycling things, okay? Not like unwanted stuff like me, you know, how do you get rid of me? <laughs> That's not what we're talking yep. about, I hope. But it's uh, recyclables. And it is complicated, even though we've learned so much in a short period of time, in a couple of decades, really, about the benefits of recycling and curbside recycling, taking right. it to the recycling center. But still, it's, it's a process. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, we're, we're taught about recycling at a young age. I'll go into, um, you know, third grade classes in the area and, and we'll teach them the basics of, of recycling. You know, the three R's, right? Reduce, reuse, and recycle. And, okay. and most people get that. Uh, but there's a lot of material that makes up our waste stream and it, it can be confusing. You call it something called a what, solid waste hierarchy. <laughs> yeah, so, so there's a, the term called the solid waste hierarchy and like I said, most people are familiar with the first half of the hierarchy, the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle. But beyond that, there's composting, resource, in re resource recovery in the form of waste to energy, and then at the bottom, landfilling. So those all make up the solid waste hier hierarchy and we want to the, the, the items at the top of the hierarchy, so waste reduction is most preferable, and then landfilling at the bottom is least preferable. So what do you mean by waste reduction? Uh, so that would be, say, buying in bulk to re reduce your packaging waste at the grocery store. Anything we do to minimize the waste that we throw, say, in the garbage can 
or even to minimize the things we have to throw in the recycling because we want to reduce waste before we even have to worry about recycling it. How do we do in Olmstead County from a participation and general, you, you know, recycling uh, compared with the state? Um, that's a very good uh, question. For the Olmstead County specifically, we're at about a 59% recycling rate between uh, businesses and uh, community members. I don't have the, the recycling good? rate. That, yeah, that's I mean, very good. So uh, to, for a perspective, in 2010, we were at about 37%. Wow. So, so we are seeing um, an increase in participation, so that's great. What do you attribute that to? Is it just education? Education, um, community awareness. I, I think, you know, aside from just what we do in Olmsted County, there's a national level of, or national awareness of putting things in their proper place. Right. Now you ha you're here kind of to unveil this cool thing, the <laughs> yeah. waste wizard. Absolutely. It's not you. Is no, that no, I, oh. no I, I am not the waste <laughs> wizard. Uh, kind of a catchy name though. Yes, we just unveiled this. Uh, it's on our website, olmsteadwaste.com. It serves as sort of a one-stop um, information hub for all your waste disposal needs. So we often get questions, okay, how do I get rid of my computer? How do I get rid of my TV? How do I get rid of my you know, old can of paint that's been right. sitting in my garage for three years? And the Waste Wizard functions uh, very easily. You, you type it in. Yeah, let's um, do that. Let's do this oh, now. Sure. It's so simple. I'm told even program co-hosts can do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think I think At anyone can one. do it. I don't know. So we get to that screen. You know, we call it up on the internet, right? Yep. And then you're able to. You, you mentioned computer monitor, right? Yeah. Let's let's just type that in, and see yeah. what happens. Computer monitor, and. See what it tells us to do. We should have a little oh. music or something. So it says self haul recycling center plus. So that means that we have to bring it in ourselves. We can't leave it out at the end of our driveway. Exactly, exactly. They want to see it. And there might be other um, depots around town, but we can definitely accept it at the Olmsted County Recycling Center plus. There is a fee. Uh, 25 cents per pound for electronic waste, but they do not want any sort of electronic waste in your curbside recycling. That would be viewed as a uh, contaminant. Okay. okay, and so I said, I saw that it said that on there too, that there'll be a 25 cent per pound fee. So that waste wizard tells you what you can expect when you get there. Exactly. We don't, you know, um, the waste wizard should tell you where to take it, <laughs> when to take it, and then whether or not a fee applies. Okay, let's All try right. another one. Next up. Should we try cereal boxes? Let's try because it. Because I will tell you what, at my house, we are constantly talking about what, can this go in recycling? Can this... Or is it cardboard? Or is it right. in with the newspapers? Yeah. Right. Yep. Okay, so here we have cereal box. So now we have to click on another, actually on the cereal box. Box board. There. Yeah. Okay, now we have it. So that's um, curbside recycling. Yep. It looks like you can Absolutely. leave that. Absolutely. Right? You, you can put that right in your curbside um, recycling bin. You can, you'll also see that um, you can self-haul it to the Olmsted County Recycling Center Plus and drop it off. This would be a free item that you could drop off in the curbside bin um, at our recycling center. So if you don't have recycling service in your home, it doesn't mean you have to start throwing everything away in the trash. Exactly, exactly. And, and that's, why, um, that's why we are available to those who would prefer to self-haul their own um, recyclables and, and garbage as well, potentially. Did the county come up with this? I mean, did your office put this little wizard this thing together? together? It's pretty cool. It, it is very cool. So our county staff work very diligently to yeah. compile a list of hundreds of materials to put in the wizard and make sure that each wizard, or excuse me, each item in the wizard um, links to the proper place. This is actually a software that we've we're basically paying for, yeah. for use. Mm -hmm. Yep. So you, you'll you'll see this. You might find Waste Wizard Sacramento or Waste Wizard St. Petersburg, Florida. So well, still a great thing to pick yep. up on as a county yeah. to do this. Right. Okay. Last one. You know, light bulbs are really complicated because there's different kinds nowadays. Right. And is it is it glass? Is it what is it? So let's try light bulbs. So we've got okay. a halogen. That's the top one. We can try. Uh, Let's see, what if we had a halogen bulb? What would we do with that? What would a halogen bulb be, like a car? For 50 it, points. It, it, yeah, it, it, it could be a car, um, but this would be uh, an item that would go in, in the trash. So you mentioned there's different types of light bulbs. There's incandescent light bulbs that would be able to go right in the trash. Oh, wow, but, put but, in your garbage, that's what it says. Yeah, but you might see ones like a compact fluorescent bulb, which are kind of those curly Q bulbs. They have a small amount of mercury in them, which we do not want ending up in either okay. your curbside garbage or your recycling bin. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure we're handling that properly at our hazardous waste facility. Okay, and then how about LED bulbs? Let's look, take a look at that. Yeah. What are they, now what are, those aren't, uh, 
Are, are those the curly Q ones? No, nope. so the, they're going to be slightly different and more energy efficient even than a compact fluorescent bulb. The little dots, are they that one? Uh, that, yeah, yeah sort of, sort of. Um, this is more, more energy efficient. You'll find okay. them in a variety of forms. Um, but we do want to accept them at the hazardous waste facility so we can oh. recycle them properly. Really? So they're all over the place now. We have some on our deck. Yeah, yep. And hopefully the, that should last you many years to come and that's one of the benefits is that they do last so long right. so there's still is there like mercury in those also or some kind of not trace necessarily stuff mercury there, there's a small sort of electronic device um to, to put it plainly that they want to make sure it gets recycled appropriately mm -hmm. how in the world do you guys keep up in your office with all when new products come and they come to us from who knows where in the world made of who knows what do you, are you constantly getting warnings or updates or well, something? Well, we have to keep up with it, and that's actually a good point because the waste stream is constantly changing. It's constantly evolving. So, you know, baby food 20 years ago might have, might come in a, a glass jar. Right. Well, we're seeing across the industry a light weighting of materials because it's cheaper to transport. Uh, baby food might come in these multi-layered packaging, um, uh, flexible packaging materials, and that's not necessarily recycling. That would be garbage. So. We're trying to we're trying to keep up yeah. again with with the new trends um, and make sure we are disposing of the materials properly. Well, I know it's not your name, but I call you the waste wizard. <laughs> Why not? I think you ought to. Yeah, Anthony, thank you very thank much. Thank you sure. very sure. much. Sure. Hey, uh, that's it for today. Follow us on Twitter when we live tweet during the show at KSMQ. And like us on Facebook to learn more about how KSMQ is sharing stories from all over Southern Minnesota. We'll see you next time on Our Town, the show about Rochester. You can access more information about KSMQ on Facebook and at ksmq.org.